recording. All right, so we're recording live. We've got authors Jane Verzone and author Ryan Show here to sit and discuss just about anything and everything. So we'll start off the conversation with Ryan and say, how are you doing out there in California right now with everything going on? You hanging in there or pulling your hair out? Yeah, I, I you know what I it's funny because you know, as a writer, you're isolated anyway most of the time. I mean, I, it's it's funny they say, "How are you going to do with the self quarantine?" Fine, I self quarantine most of the time anyway, because <laughs> I'm busy writing. But um, you know, it's funny. I'm doing okay, but my my wife she works three days a week, and uh, she has a she has a salon, and she misses her clients. I mean, she's they're a big part of her life, and it, it, it when we're talking about what is this doing to people from an emotional standpoint? Like I watched the president the other day say something to the extent of, you know, we got to be careful that people don't go in and spiral into depression. I watched him, uh, Dr. Oz interviewing him, I think. And um, there's a lot of truth to that. The idea that you can't have something like, you know, the ability to go out and keep your normal routine, uh, I think is kind of twisting people up a little bit. I, I hope that it's not, but I, I have to think if it's twisting me up and I'm pretty, calm and patient and easy going is twisting her up a little bit, but it's, it's got to have some effect, you know, as far as the pandemonium, um, I'm a post-apocalyptic fiction writer. So <laughs> it's, it. <laughs> it's funny. It's, yeah, it, it started out looking a little familiar. Um, but it, it, you know, out here, everything's fine in, in terms of the people They're they're pretty calm and everybody's kind of easy going, but you know, we'll see how that progresses as, as time goes. How, how are you doing out there? Well, I've got three kids. I've got a seven-month-old, a five, almost five-year-old, and a seven-year-old. So my seven-year-old is out of school until April 15th, uh, mm. at least then. Um, my four-year-old goes to a, a VPK here in Florida, which is a pre-K kindergarten that the state pays for. So he does that at a Montessori school and really loves that. Yeah. Um, it's been tough for him, though, because he's out of his routine. Yeah. And he kind of thrives on his daily routine, getting up at 6, going to school at 7. He gets there at 7.30. He's got his routine of what he does, and he's very much in that. And as long as his routine is, is okay, he's okay. So not having that's been very challenging for him. Yeah. Um, and we've been trying to make it a bit of a game of doing everything here. And we're essentially homeschooling our 7-year-old right now because of all that. So, yeah. You know, you trying to get through it, but like you're saying, as an author, we work from home and we and we are largely isolating ourselves anyways. Yeah. Um, the hardest part for me is being told that when I actually do want to get out, which isn't often, I can't, mm -hmm. or I'm not supposed yeah. to. And it's very difficult because with my kids home, I want to take them to the YMCA so they can get some swim in for an hour, burn out a bunch of energy so they yeah. can they're you know, a little more tuckered out. And that's closed. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, let's take him to the park. But you can't. The playground's all closed. And so that's kind of challenging, too. Um, so it's been a little interesting to, re you know, change things around. But, you know, yeah. right now I'm just trying to focus on how do we create positive things? Because there's a lot of negativity that can inundate us. And at the end of the day, so true. we have to wake up every day. And we have to make a conscious decision to choose to be happy to choose to not get engulfed in the negativity because it is so easy to do. It's so easy for me to turn on the news. And see the end of the world. That's the start right there. <laughs> or look at Facebook and it's yep. in the world. I've had to like, you know, snooze or unfriend like 20 different people in the last, you know, three, four days because I can't stand to like scroll through my newsfeed and all I see is end of the world stuff. It's just not, yeah. one, it's not true. And second, yeah. it's just depressing. It and is. I don't want to inundate that myself with that because if I see that all the time, I'm going to become depressed. Right. <laughs> well, it's, that. yeah, it is true. You start immersing yourself in it and, and, and looking at how bad things can be and, and things can be bad. There's people that are having a hard time for sure. Um, and I feel for those people. I, yeah. I want to kind of come at that news with a sense of, you know, let me kind of stop and say a prayer for these people. I don't want to be thinking to myself, oh, I hate this, or I hate that, or I hate these people, or everything's being done wrong. It's so easy to fall into that trap. I, I remember, I remember a story. Do you remember the um, monk on the cover of Rage Against the Machine album yeah. who had set himself on fire and basically meditated to his own death and even move? 
there's there's a saying um i took martial arts for a number of years um 10 11 years I, i've done it and they talk about meditation like anybody can meditate in a quiet room where you know there's no distractions but can you go meditate when you set yourself on fire in a protest in the middle of the street and not move a muscle until you're dead and it, the reason that i say that extreme is because it's easy for us to try and look at things and say, well, we're going to focus on the bright side of everything. Uh, and we're, we're not going to look at the, the negativity, but we're, we're in an echo chamber of negativity, like you said, and kind of fear and hysteria. So these are, these are probably the most important times to be able to kind of center yourself and, and think about things. I, I had an interview uh, last night and we were talking about, um, the negativity on the news, like you said. And one of the things I was, I was thinking about is there's two, two sides to this coin. The first side is that we can look at it and say, well, everything's going awful. You know, everyone who sits back, you know, behind their computer looking at Facebook can say, oh, these people are doing a terrible job or they're doing a good job, but they're not walking in their shoes. They don't have the responsibility that, that, that the people who are in charge do. They're not, the people that are stuck behind their computer are not the people that are gonna go out there and work a 48 hour shift in the middle of hell in a hospital, trying to take care of sick people, not sure if they're gonna get the sickness, if they're gonna take it to their loved ones. These are the people that I look at and I go, man, look at the human spirit there. And I think, look at America when they come together, look at these plants, these factories that are repurposing for ventilators and masks and the donations and the people coming together in, in their communities. And I think to myself, this is the beauty that, that we have as Americans that yeah. That is the other side of the coin is look at the goodness of people that's coming out. It's tempting to get in and look at all the negativity, but in, in, in an echo chamber like this, it's important, I think, to look at everything that is positive is happening. That way, when you, when you come to people who are suffering and, and having you know, a hard time, and we know people that are going through this, you can kind of come to them from a, a little bit better place. Not like you got all this noise and you know, static on you from yeah. arguing on Facebook because that's easy to do. We can all do that. Yeah. Some of us can do it better than others. <laughs> yeah. And part of it was just like I was listening. Some people were talking about how the president's initiated this uh, defense act where they can mandate a firm produce X, Y, or Z. Yeah. And they're talking about how he hasn't been using it. And I heard him talk last night during the press conference. He says, look, we have it. We haven't had to use it. Yeah. And the reason we haven't had to use is because companies have been willingly converting their, their factories and their tool shops to help us. This was yeah. put in place when you had companies tell the government to pound sand, you can't do this. Well, then you use this act and you take over the company and you do it. Right. But when companies are voluntarily doing it, you don't need to. But what that says to me is that everyone's coming together for the greater mm -hmm. good. They're not being yeah. selfish. They're not being, um, you know, they're, they're not turning their back on each other. And that's what's important is that the big corporations, the big people are doing that because we sure as heck aren't going to see that from the media. And it's sad because what's happened in the media, a lot of people don't always realize why it is the way it is. So it's, it, it, it is sensational and it is negative for a very specific reason. And that's because the media is, is become largely online media. It's not yeah. so much print anymore. And because it's online, what it is is they generate ad dollars based on the number of clicks and the number of impressions to a site. The more impressions that come to, say, the New York Times or ProPublica or one of these other forums, the more they can charge in advertising dollars and the more yeah. ad space they can sell to company X, Y, and Z. So yeah. you generate the impressions by creating sensational articles or or headlines, things that cause click people bait. to click, and then you cause people to share it, which expands the click base, expands everything. So there's an enormous monetary benefit to creating that kind of an environment more so than there is just presenting factual news and information yeah. and letting people make the decision for themselves. That's why I encourage anyone, like if you wanna know about what Bernie Sanders is saying, or Joe Biden, or the president, or what's going on with COVID-19, go directly to the source. 
listen to YouTube for the candidates because they're all, all their stuff is always on YouTube. So listen yeah. to them directly talk on YouTube. Go to Joe Rogan's show where you can listen to them talk for two hours or three hours and listen to the daily briefing where there is no filter. It's directly from the people in charge and managing it. And you can hear without, without someone filtering it for you, telling you or what putting their opinion on everything. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, you know, yeah, you bring up a good point. I mean, especially for us, like we're, we're research fanatics, we're research yeah. freaks. We, we have to, you know, we have, a, we have a certain obligation to, when we're fictionalizing a story, um, to make it feel as real as possible. I mean, you want someone to feel like they're immersed in your story, like they're walking every footstep with your character. And so when, when we do that as, as authors, we, it, it's, we exert a tremendous amount of effort and energy to make sure that we get as much as we can right. We're not perfect. We don't get everything right. But for the most part, that's, that's important to us. And so what we do is we filter through all of that garbage, all of that noise, that static, that just blah. And we get down to, like you said, you get down to the raw footage. Let's yeah. get down to, you know, what are the words that come out of your mouth? Not, not put into, you know, little clips that, uh, you know, that you can, you can run as a five second ad on, on your news uh, broadcast, uh, not something where you can run a headline, but I, I want to hear what you say a minute and a half before the headline and a minute and a half after the headline, because that's so many, so many times you, you find that there's a whole different message conveyed that wasn't there in the first place. And so, yep. you know, as people who are trying to get the news, especially too, and we're stuck in our homes, uh, at least I am in California. It sounds like you are too in Florida. But when you know when we're stuck in our homes and we need the news, there's there's getting information, and the easiest, the low hanging fruit is often the garbage you don't want to pay attention to. That's the stuff that you want to research through and go, oh okay, um, let me go start sourcing it. And a lot of times, this is how you find out who's real fake news: is you you dig down in and you go, where's the source material and what do they say. And if there's no source yeah. material, you can't believe them by virtue of the fact that you can't, you can't uh, source it yourself. Yeah. Stuff that you can source yourself, you can watch the raw footage. I watch a lot of, um, you know, I watch a lot of the Senate briefings, the Senate hearings. Yeah, and, I do. You know, you, you get to the no BS version of things this way. So, yeah, I think as authors where, where we want to find the truth of things uh, as, a, as Americans, we should want to find the truth of things so that we're not sheep led by our nostrils to where someone else wants us to go. Yep. So, so when you write your book, in these times, because you, you write a lot of post apoc Yeah. How do you keep yourself sane writing end of the world stuff all the time without being depressed or not falling into a funk? If that's kind of how you write, because <laughs> it's not exactly happy endings to any of your maybe the characters are going to you know be somewhat happy but the fact is their yeah. life is going to be different and tens of millions or billions of people have died that's a good question and you know what it's something that that resonates with me i tend to write fairly fast um just because i've got a pretty hungry audience i mean i know that your audience looks for books about every three months and there's some really great authors yourself included in there that you know really go in and dig in and, and take time to Put these things together and the the post apoc audience tends to be pretty ravenous um and and i think maybe it's because they don't it's not as large a genre as you know like uh thriller so there's not in post apoc we don't really have traditional authors other than william fortune who wrote you know one second after but we don't really have traditional authors that write this work so it's really up to us to provide about 99 percent of the content so in terms of writing fast, I stay in a, a story um, regularly. Like when I'm finishing up uh, my current book, I'm already you know, planning my next book and I give myself about a week to decompress and roll into the next one. So I'm in, you know, I'm in a, a 1,200 or 1,500 pages of story regularly and it can get a little bit depressing. But what I've learned is that this is representative of people's struggles in life. I mean, a lot of, a lot of our readers are older. Um, some of them are, are handicapped or they're bedridden. Uh, some of them are with parents who are ill and seen the last days of their life. And this is kind of their escape. And so what post-apocalyptic fiction represents to a lot of them, from what I'm told, is that 
we have these gigantic problems, these all encompassing problems that we don't know how to figure out. And so one of the messages that tends to ring through on all of my books is that sense of um, your, your mindset. The mindset is everything. The mindset that you're gonna roll through this and you're gonna dig out what's good in life. And that's kind of what we were talking about earlier is we can look at this major crisis that we have and say, man, this is depressing as hell. Or, and maybe because I've conditioned myself, we can look at it and say, but where's the good in it? Because there's good in everything. And so near, near usually like book three, book four in a five or six book series yeah. with mine gets really dark because that's when, that's when things are at their darkest. And then it's my job and my responsibility as a writer to now in, you know, uh, the next or the last book to be able to instill that sense of hope and say, where, where do we go from here? You know, where do we, uh, where do we find a way to to find the silver lining and live in the silver lining? Yeah. You know, you write a lot of war stuff, and you've yeah. you've lived that life. How do you pull? How do you pull yourself out of some of that? Yeah, that gets kind of challenging sometimes. I guess that's probably why I'm taking a break to do some sci-fi. To be honest with you, <laughs> um, it's very research intensive because our audience is largely a lot of ex-military yeah. or those uh, corporal sergeant majors who went to the war college at 19. And uh, mm -hmm. really know everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, As I wish I was. <laughs> I know. And so you've got to be very, um, very accurate with a lot of your, your information. But you're also talking about foreign militaries a lot of times. So it's not just knowing about the American equipment, which, mind you, upgrades and changes fairly often. It's also yeah. knowing, okay, what is there, what is the current modern day Russian equipment that they're using? Yeah. Or if you're dealing with the Chinese, what is the equipment they're using? or the South Koreans or the Chinese, because when you write those scenes, those units have to use those types of equipment. Um, and it needs to be equipment that's currently in use and not what you re recall from even your own military service 10 or 15 right. years ago. This stuff has changed and technology changes a lot too. Especially so, now. Yeah, so it, it's, a, it's very research intensive to write the kind of books we do. Um, and that's partially why it takes so long to do them. Um, and the other piece is we really integrate our beta reader team. And so I have about 90 people on, on the team and I've broken them down by military branches. So when I write specific scenes that involve Marine units, those scenes I usually send to my handful of Marines who read it and they go in and they say, okay, well in the, in the Marines, this is how we would call it. This is how we would say it. This is how we would name this or what we would call this. Cause it's distinctly different than how the army does. Yeah, uh, And then the same with like the army, when I have a tank scene or I have an airborne scene, I've got a couple of readers who are tankers in the first Gulf War. And then I've got a couple of airborne guys who've done combat jumps and they'll help me craft those scenes. So when they're in the C-17 or the C-130, it's a realistic call out of what's going on. When they land, their steps from the time their drop bag lands, the time they get there, to the time they're on fastening the rifle and getting that loaded and their patrol packs, I mean, it's all very real and visual. You can see it because it's written by guys who have already done it. Um, so I think, like you say, as an author, your job is to make sure you do things as accurate as you can, but that involves leveraging your audience. Yeah, oh yeah. And we have a good audience to leverage, and so I yeah. really try to make use of that. Yeah, you know, there's. it's funny because I've looked at, you and I have talked about this uh, a number of times, is that the accuracy, there's two ways you can go. You can put the camera one foot from the action, um, and there's a greater responsibility when you're putting it one foot from the action. You, like you said, every last detail has to be right down to the shoelaces. Um, it's that's that's where you have these big books and the audience that you have. They look at all these details, and there's a specialness in it when it gets when when you get it right. Yeah. Um, yep. And there's a little you know reader fatigue if you don't get it right. Even a little detail can spoil everything. Yep. And um, it's tough because your audience, my audience are a little bit different. I try to pull from a, maybe a 30 or 40 foot view and I have an understanding of the, the branches of the military to, to a degree just because I come from a military family, but I was never active military. I took, um, I wanted to do karate instead. Uh, and maybe just cause you know, I'm an adrenaline junkie. And uh, you know, when I started taking karate, we weren't, we were a war, but it's not something that was, you know, in our faces. Like we need, we need people to enlist. Otherwise I probably would have, <laughs> but yeah. you know, you, 
you, you choose your, your routes in life. And so for me, a lot of the post APOC is me being stuck um, in cities that are coming down all around you. And it's in that what's sense, available, what's around you. Yeah, exactly. And in that sense too, from my training, um, probably from, I'd say from my, in my black belt years is when the mindset really changes. When you, when you get into a black belt, position, your mindset changes. You stop thinking of things in terms of, you know, getting it right and doing competition fighting. And you start thinking of down and dirty, the nastiness on the street. Like if you had four or five or six people come at you all at once yep. and you don't have any weapons, how do you dispense your way through all of them? You know, how do you get out of the circle? Use one to block the others. How do you move? Um, you know, if you've got a knife, but you don't have a gun, but they have knives, how do you move? These are things that, you know, we, we were trained to look at. Um, in a very, like I said, down and dirty, nasty scenario. And so for me, this is my expertise. And so when you bring someone in who is not trained military and you put them in the middle of hell and now you don't know where enemies are coming from because they're coming from everywhere, how do you handle yourself? That's my specialty yeah. is, is I can kind of bring in, uh, you know, bring in that aspect. Whereas from a technical standpoint in military, that's going to be your aspect. So it's, yeah. it, these conversations are intriguing to me because you come from, you know, you come from military. I come it's from different, you know, you have, you, in a city environment where things are collapsing and falling apart, you know, you're dealing with average one in the middle, normal Joes. Yeah. In our situation, if we're writing about, you know, that, you know, battle taking place in Korea or in Ukraine, we're talking about an infantry company or a battalion fighting another battalion or another company. And it's totally different because the weapons are, and tactics are way different than what civilians have. I mean, they're way more deadly, but they're way different. Um, you know, you've got vehicles and, and artillery and mortars and, you know, rockets and, and, and all kinds of weapons, weaponry that's brought to bear. And so the tactics are way diff are, are, are different because, you don't fight the same way civilians will in an urban environment. Right. They don't know those tactics and they don't have the same type of equipment to use in those kinds of tactics. Um, so it's a completely different level of, like say, how you would approach it. I wouldn't even know how to necessarily approach it from your perspective because I don't think that way. Yeah. I haven't had to um, or be around it. So I just don't know how you would do that. When we did combative trainings in the military, they would always teach you, I mean, our, our, our training wasn't about putting someone in, in a submission hold or putting someone to knock them out. It was, you do this position here to kill the person. You do this position here to, you know, ram the knife through into the heart or into the lung. Every, every move, every position was a kill position that was being taught. It wasn't about submissions. And well, the and ultimate rule was taught was the guy who wins in a ground fight is the guy whose buddy shows up with a rifle first. Yeah. That was always the rule. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is interesting because that's kind of the level I got to when you get, when you get into black belt training, at least in, in my dojo, my sensei was phenomenal. I love my sensei. He's, he's incredible, but he was also, I mean, I spent 10 years Bruce and, and, uh, beaten, but you know, he asked me when I started to train, when I first started to train, he says, what do you want to get out of this? I said, I want to, I want to fight to defend myself and, and win every time. And um, he said, well, there's two ways you can do that. I can train you the nice way, the civilized way, the way that everybody else gets trained, or I can train you the right way. And you're not going to like me very much, and you're going to be in pain a lot, but you're going to know what to do. And I said, I want that way. And so he, you know, he was true to his word. <laughs> so um, but when we get into Black Belt, these are the things that we look at. So a lot of post-apocalyptic fiction is getting from point A to point B, saving yeah. families, and those are all good scenarios because they focus, yeah, they focus on the survival element, which is, you know, what are the things that you have? Do you have your, you know, what's the rifles do you have? The, the MREs, do you have your packs, right? You know, what types you're using? And for me, I'm being an adrenaline junkie. That stuff's fantastic. And there are some great authors who've done that well to the point where I don't think I could top what they do. But I think that in terms of urban warfare and post-apocalyptic fiction, uh, being an adrenaline junkie, I want to be in there. So my books are pretty violent. Um, I don't typically, there's not typically a whole lot of swearing, if, if any, in them. Um, the, any of the romance is kind of light and just there to keep the mood airy. I've got kind of a, 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 a 
twisted sense of humor, so that gets in there as well. But by and large, it's about survival. And survival on the street is exactly what you said, is if you don't have a buddy that's there with you, how do you, how do you dispense with somebody and move on to the next one quickly? How yeah. can you work your way through a crowd? How can you hit the outside of a crowd and circle your way in without getting your position blown? These are all things that most civilians don't think about, but if, if you're in a situation where you're in an urban environment and everything goes crazy, you have to understand you're probably gonna die. That's probably what's gonna happen. And so your job is just to stay alive. And the way to do that, unfortunately, is to kill your way through the people that present the biggest issue. Yeah. You know, or get out of the situation, not engage if that's warranted. So how do you come up with your ideas? Because I have to imagine that after you've written three, four, or five different series, there comes to a point where you have written as many scenarios as possible. Like I had read um, some of Bobby Ackhart's books many years ago mm -hmm. before he became as prolific as he has. Mm -hmm. But I look at it and I'm like, man, I don't know that there's a scenario he hasn't covered. And it's yeah. one of those things where once you've covered all of these areas, how much more can you legitimately keep writing? Um, you know, because I've had the same, I run some of the same thing with the, the military war books I write too, is there's only so many wars you can write about. There's only so many realistic scenarios that you can go over and hash over. It's like, how many times can you write a Korean war book? You know, second Korean War. I mean, yeah, you can do it a couple of times, but once you've yeah. done it a couple of times and a couple of different variations, you really can't keep going that route. You know, you got to find something yeah. new. You don't want your yeah, you don't want your your readers to stale on your writing. Right. And 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 that is a good question because we look at that. I've written three series now in post-apocalyptic fiction, and I think to myself, you know, what's next? And you look at authors who've done it right. Um, you know, in, in my group, that's going to be people like, you know, Boyd Craven and, uh, you know, Franklin Horton. The, the, these guys are some of the staples that have been around for a while. Bobby Eckhart. Um, you start looking at, I think you can probably put different takes on it. We've got women that are writing in this, um, in the apocalypse now, which I'm actually really happy because they bring a different take. Um, you know, you've got people like T.L. Payne and, and, um, Kyla Stone, they're on top of the charts right now and do, doing very well because they've been able to take scenarios that have been written by men writers and now bring in a different perspective. And so what they're doing is they're bringing in um, a female readership that quite frankly wasn't really there before to, to the extent that it is. And I'm, I'm happy about that um, because 80% of readers are women anyway. But the question that you asked does present a, a good um, or, or a tough scenario, which is how do you keep your writing fresh? How do you keep it fresh for yourself? I won't write the same story twice and I won't write if I'm bored because I can't. <laughs> so I'm, you know, as writers, we're always at work, you know, um, uh, Nicholas Sparks said it well, his, his wife said, why are you sitting on the couch doing nothing? And he said, I'm not, I'm working. I said, no, you're not. You're not typing us. No, no. I'm thinking of the story. I'm working right now. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. first I thought, oh, you know, that's kind of funny. That's, that's that's, that's funny. Very true. But, it's but it's true. Just thinking. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. Sometimes I don't sleep because I just sit there and think to myself, this story is not right enough, or it needs a little bit of a tweak, or how can I make this a little bit different? And and so yeah, where you step into science fiction a little bit, that's where I look at it and say, okay, well, how can I take a little bit different scenario that keeps the existing readers that I have, but also keeps material fresh and breaks into a new audience. And that's the challenge that we have, like where you looked at sci-fi to a degree. I also do that as well. I love science fiction stuff. Um, I, I like the I like the unknown. I like venturing into the the deep state, the deep space of uh, a new genre. Yeah. And so, I think for for us to to get creative, and I don't know if you've got the same problem I have, is when I'm looking at a computer all day, I don't want to go read on a Kindle, but you know, I take the blue shade, I take the blue shade off and I go sit down and read some of these other authors and their work is inspiring because it allows your mind to go in different directions. I don't read as much in post-apocalyptic fiction. I read everywhere else. And I think that helps keep my post-apocalyptic fiction fresh. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, what, to, like what sparked you into to looking at sci-fi? And I was talking to you about this briefly the other day, but yeah, you know, so I like reading sci-fi. Um, I like reading different, uh, like the Von Hefner writes really good sci-fi. I read his 
we did a, a short military series called Invasion USA, which was pretty cool. It's based on the, the Chinese invasion stuff. And I thought that was really great. Um, and and he, he writes pretty good sci-fi. And I just enjoy it, though. I like thinking about space. I like thinking about the future and technology and exploring and seeing what else is out there and how, you know, space combat's going to be totally different. And it's just neat to think about because it's so different than what we have now. The other cool thing is there's no, there's usually not politics involved in it. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's always politics in war and, you know, you, it's tiring. you can either omit it entirely, which is tough. Yeah. Because you're like, well, what's going on with this? I mean, this would be heavily involved in this decision-making process. Or people insert it and they do it haphazardly and it's just, it flops. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, in any conflict, the president is going to, is the ultimate arbiter of determining, are we going to war or not? And if yeah. they are, are we going to win this war or are we just going to try to fight to not lose? Uh, those are different strategies. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's frustrating when people admit that. But that's what I like about sci-fi. I don't have to have any of that in there. I'm just able to completely take a break from it. It's not as heavily researched um, because you're making up the weapons. You're making yeah. up the different things. And in space, weapons don't have ranges. <laughs> they, don't have yeah. effective, they don't have a range and an effective range and a maximum range. Right. Um, it's all about distances and speeds and kilometers per hour and how long it takes to travel a light year or, or not light year, but a distance, point A to point B. And those are very simple calculations and things to use compared to when you're talking about a Chinese tank versus an American tank, because one has a 120 millimeter, you know, smooth bore, and one has 125 millimeter, and the different projectiles and what the ranges are, and if they're at a certain distance, then it can punch through a certain millimeter level of armor versus if it's further away, it can't. Well, you got to know that crap when you're writing a, a war book. Yeah, that hurts you don't my have brain. to have any of that when you <laughs> sci-fi. It's just right out there. So yeah. it's, for me, it's fun. It's refreshing. It's just doing something different. Now, will the series succeed and go off great? I have no clue. I would like to think this thing is going to blow it out of the water because I've read a lot of sci-fi and there's a lot of aspects of warfare that sci-fi authors don't just admit. They just don't yeah. think. And I don't know if it's because they don't know about it, they don't think about it or, or what, but there's a lot of aspects of modern warfare that transcend, tech, that transcend uh, generations. Right. That are always going to be in warfare, but they're right. not in sci-fi. I have no freaking idea why. So I'm incorporating them in my sci-fi. I'm pretty sure that my sci-fi is going to hit it, you know, hit the ground hard and running because I've kept a lot of that. Well, you're bringing in a new element that's that doesn't exist, um, you know, over over a larger range in sci-fi. I brought um, I brought uh, AI into post epoch and I also, in this last series, um, Dark Days of the After, uh, the series that you see on my walls, Dark Days of the Enclave, that's the fourth book. But the Dark Days of the After series is basically written in 2030. Uh, and it's, you know, the book 1984 meets um, Chai Kam Occupation. Yeah. The Communist Chinese occupy the West Coast. Uh, the president's been, basically went over to try and negotiate stuff with uh, the, the president of China never came back and uh, the military has been sent out to all these wars uh, with no command to return yet and told sit tight while it's dark we'll, we'll get to you when we're ready and so this mass invasion of, of America occurred and these are not these are not typically themes you see in post apoc and although it doesn't garner the larger audience what it does is it takes that that really hungry audience and you give them something new. And I think that's yes. the way, because you grow your audience inside, you know, your genre, and then you can bring them with you to, like you said, everything that people like about your, your work, the, the, yeah. the warfare aspect, you're going to bring now, and you're going to put it in a little bit different setting. So you'll have that familiarity and the freshness. And yeah, you know, we can only put a book out there and see how it, see how it does to figure yeah. out whether or not we're going to be successful but Scary. that's just part of the joy too i mean you got to take risks in life if you don't take risks in life you can sit on your ass and do nothing that's boring i can't live a boring life i know it's, it's scary but i'm i'm optimistic that it's going to do well i'm bringing the same type of uh thriller writing style and my realism and detail level to combat stuff 
into this new series. And so I think it's going to do really, really good. Uh, my readers are already eager and chopping at the bit. They've all named all the characters. Um, I'm one of them. I'm waiting. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all in there. I'm And I'm doing something else really kind of cool and unique and different. I can probably pull this up for you. I'm creating um, dossiers of different aspects of information in the stories. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I so like, like what happens is a lot of... Um, I'll pull this one up. Well, it allows us to, to geek out a little bit on the, the, the characters or at yes. least a little bit more depth into the story. It's Correct. Part of the, because part of the problem is you don't have, um, you cannot, you, you don't want to have diarrhea of the mouth in, in the book. It's too much information and then yeah. nobody likes it. So what I'll share with you, nobody else has seen this stuff yet. Um, so what I'm doing is I have like this coming up where I have, um, you know, That's awesome. The military structure, you know, brief history on Space Command, military structure of it. So we have the you know, fleet force structure, you can list officers enlisted, the Republic Army and the special forces structure, um, number of ships and servers at the times of books one and two, and then the number of them going forward, major space, major stations, you know, so this was it's a glossier or, or a dossier, but a of information for the reader to be able to reference back to before they even dig into the story. It's command structure Anyways, too, which is good. Yeah, it saves me from having to do it all there. The other one I had is I've created this, um, you know, this, I, I'm going to clean this up, of course, but, you know, this gives you the, the a big visual representation of, you know, one of the main ships that we have in the series, you know, the, the, the Voyager. Uh, it's an orbital command, it's a command ship and an orbital assault ship. So you've got multiple large rail cannons on the top. You've got missile platforms and, and then a couple laser banks. Um, our ships end up being totally ineffective with lasers against enemy ships because they have a bigger power source and more power than ours, but our mag rails seem to be able to punch right through their, their armor because their armor is geared for deflecting direct energy weapons and not kinetic weapons. Totally different you know, way there. And then we have down below here, these are all the, the orbital um, launch systems. So. So I've got other, like, this is a great picture here. So what happens is the armored sheath, you know, moves up. And then on the sides here, the orbital assault ships drop down. And each one of these ships um, essentially carries a platoon, you know, of uh, 52 soldiers, you know, inside of each of these things. Um, nice. You know, and then in the, in the front here, we have, you know, this is going in, in for launch, ships launching in you know, cargo ships or, um, you know, a ground assault aircraft and then launching out on the other side. So you have, uh, do you have pictures of these ships? Cause the, what you have is you have this dossier that's still up there. Oh, I didn't know if you switched over. I got to switch that over. Stop sharing. Let me go and do, oh, I wasn't showing you. All right. Let me do screen. All right. Is this showing them now? Oh, there you go. Oh, man. All right. Here we go. Those are so sweet. I knew you had those somewhere. Sorry about that. My <laughs> That's bad. Okay. I'm talking and you didn't see anything. Okay. So this is the, the Republic Naval Ship Voyager, the RNS Voyager. Um, you know, it's our big beast of a ship. It basically can carry 860 soldiers, which is one battalion. Um, and it's got your, your mag rail turrets up on the top and then two on the one on the bottom. Um, the sides down here is where the orbital assault ships are kept at. So here you have in the front, you've got, you know, where ships can come in and dock. On the other side you have is where they're launched. This is, you know, for your launching your ground attack aircraft or supply cargo transports. Down did you, here. Did you design these? No, I hired some uh, design, a graphic designer to build them you, all for me. You had someone design them for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. He's really good. And yeah. so. These things are all armored. Basically, what happens is they lift up to reveal the, the assault ships, then they each just launch out of here. And each one of these assault ships carries a platoon or about 52 soldiers. We beefed up our <laughs> platoons and companies and battalions so that way they're actually pretty hard hitting units. That's incredible. Um, this, way, this way, the orbital assault ship comes into, when it comes into, into um, you know, an area, it can deploy a full battalion. Yeah. Um, or, or, or a group of special forces, and it can also do a bit of a fight. Uh, a fight. Uh, the other ship I have is um, the RNS Rook, which is uh, a battle cruiser. So that's your, your heavy hitting combat ship. Um, again, he designed this one as well for me. 
uh, designed with a different purpose and mission. So this one's got three, uh, three mag rail turrets on the side. Wow. Um, and then down, down in this area here, it's equipped with um, a lot of anti-ship missiles, like ship to ship missiles. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then um, all scattered all throughout the ship, which you'll see um, these smaller weapon turrets here. They're scattered Every throughout. Detail. Yeah. The, those are all the, basically your SeaWiz systems, your close in weapon support systems. Um, so when you have enemy aircraft or missiles being flown in, these seven barrel, uh, you know, Gatling guns are just whipping out rounds like crazy, <laughs> intercepting them all. Um, to Make me want to go in these things, man. These things are awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, so, yeah. It, it's funny when you look at something like this, in, in some cases, a whole story comes together. It does. On... So we're making these dossiers. They're going to be really professional yeah. when they're all said and done. And these will be sent out for people who join our mailing list. Nice. Um, or I might try to make like a color book version of them all to yeah. sell those as a companion. Um, you know, and so we've got all the specs of them up here. You know, this one only carries 620, 28 sailors, 212 soldiers, which is one company. So basically what their design is to do is either carry one company of regular army soldiers, um, which you call RAS, or Republic Army soldiers, we call them RAS or RAs. Mm -hmm. or a company of deltas which are our special forces um, because the, the plot of the whole story is essentially after the 2040s big world war three happens everything's devastated in the wake of it all you know the chinese consolidate asia into the asian alliance the u.s consolidates most of north america into you know the republic uh europe it consoli consolidates up with russia the great greater europe um and that's essentially your three factions going into 2090 when this series essentially starts and takes place. Nice. Uh, How yeah, big is so this book? Right now, book one is 113,000 words. It's essentially okay. done, but uh, when my wife gets done adding her pieces to it, I'm sure it'll increase a little. Uh, about 515, 520? About 110, and I'm about a third of the way into book three. Nice. So I have nice. a lot more ships, though. I have more ships for the alien race that we encounter. Those are under construction right now. We have another wow. assault ship called the Osprey, which is our um, orbital assault ship that the Special Forces use. Uh, that ship's being constructed. It's different than the, the other ones that you saw earlier. Um, we got a couple cargo ships that are being built, a troop, a troop ship. Um, a star carrier is going to be created. And then we have our second generation of warships, which is the group that once we've fought these aliens, we start integrating a lot of their technology. So then we start creating some more advanced warships. Well, I have a whole another set of warships that's going to be created for the subsequent, like book three, four, and five onward. So I think that's cool. I think that's cool. What are you going to release in about three months apart? Two months apart? You know, I'm trying to do these actually a little tighter. Um, so I'm going to probably drop the pre order before the end of. Falling Empire series before Vent Retribution comes out, so people will be able to start doing the pre-order. I'm not sure when this is going to come out yet. It's either going to be in July or in August, but my goal is to hopefully have book two release within six to eight weeks after that, and then do the same with book three, and then there will be a pause. Okay. Um, there probably will be like a, a four to six month pause while I work on the next set. Because part of what I wanted to do is I think I want to write the prequel to this series, which would be that large world war that takes place in the 2040s. Yeah. And, and then what we do is we see a lot of the older characters from this series will be young in the next series. I got gotcha. you. We'll do three books in that one to kind of bring them up to speed. And then we'll restart again with another three books to continue this series as it goes further. So it's just like a second arc. It's, yeah. So then it's okay. essentially nine books was what would tentatively be planned for this this world that we're sort of creating. Right. And because of the, the way the arc is and the story, it theoretically could go on in, in you know dozens and dozens of books because there's different avenues and branches you could you could go off of if yeah. you kind of wanted to. Well um, sci fi allows for that. You have a lot of does. yeah, you have a lot of uh, longer series in, in that. Well, it's kind of funny. Like <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's kind of funny. You're talking about the political end of things. I, I was looking at, to some degree, looking at urban fantasy for that very reason. I mean, it's it's funny how you and I are both figuring out how can we get away from stuff that's <laughs> politically politically charged, because 
you, I mean, you can't, you almost can't in, in our field to some degree, because yeah. like you said, you know, you've got the president involved and, you know, people, people either love him or hate him. It doesn't seem to be much middle ground um, with our, with our own president. But now I, I think it's interesting how you're building up this, this world that's um, this world around you with, with sci-fi. And it is interesting because like for me, I study, I study locations. The location drives the story for me. And I can see how where you're building these ships, it's like, I, I want to know more about them. I want to know what the inside's like. I want to know what the, you know, which characters are doing. And I think that builds the intrigue. That's one of the things that's beautiful about being an independent author is that we can go in and create these worlds however we want. You know, I'll go on Pinterest and find the characters in the way that they, they look in my mind. I'll go find people that look similar to them. And that's what I base them off of is these are kind of my inspirational characters, inspirational places, and I can get those to, to my readers. And so it creates uh, like a more solid universe for them. And I think that overall that lends to the enjoyment that the reader has. So yeah, I think that'd be pretty cool. Uh, yeah, it'd, what be you're showing is awesome. it'd be a lot of fun to do that and then figuring out, you know, what do I do for the insides of the ships? How much do I do? You know, I want to have some drawings and uh, creations of some of the shipyards that are going to be built and the space elevators. And, and But it's neat because we can go and explore other planets. You know, we're going to have new allies that we're going to form. Yeah. We're going to have new enemies that we're going to be fighting and alliances that we'll be a part of and in war with. And you Not can limited have to species books. either. Yeah, you can have it in all these different species. And you can have these entire book just on this invasion of this particular planet and the grunts having to struggle through surviving this this onslaught and dealing with it. Yeah. Um, it's just a lot more fun, I think. And when it becomes more, when it's fun, it's not work and it just flows much faster. And it's, it's yeah. more, more interesting. Well, and that's the thing too that you had, you had kind of alluded to. When you're, when you're focusing on something that's grounded in reality and in mind mine's grounded in reality to an extent too just because you know you're not going to have witches or mages you're not going to have you know creatures from mars or uh whole separate universes you you don't you don't really have those things we have to stay grounded in reality to a, a large degree and so we're we're boxed into certain parameters that when you roll into sci-fi or urban fantasy or you know futuristic stuff for me which is sci-fi that hasn't you know, you've got a reality that hasn't happened, we can at that point in time start to lend our creativity as opposed to have to sit down and, and hash out every little tiny detail. Like for you, you're going to get everything right now, but the guy that reads it a year from now where things have changed might be like, oh, you didn't get it right. And then you're going to see a stupid one-star review, some clown saying you didn't, you didn't get it right. And you're like, oh man, <laughs> you know, that happens, that happens to us. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed kind of hearing your, your process in this, this new book. And I've, the, 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 the series that you have going on right now is fantastic. I'm reading rigged right now. So it's, it, it's good that you've got series that you can lean on for new readers, but I think it is good, at least for keeping our minds fresh to step yeah. outside of the bounds of reality to, to well, the degree, part is, come back to this. Yeah. I mean, I, I take 18 months is, is usually how long I take to write a series when mm -hmm. I start to sit down and do it. Um, so it's nice to take that time because when I can, when I come back to writing some of the, or, or re rehashing out some of the war books again, I'm going to be approaching with such a fresh mind again and a fresh worldview of what's going on in um, 2021. Yeah. That, you know, it's going to be again, more fun and fresh. I, I mean, I have, I've been, Toying this idea of doing a South American series for a while. I'm definitely doing it. We're going to do a big invasion of Venezuela and Cuba and, you know, that whole, whole area there, you know, the rope in the, you know, the Chinese uh, Silk Road initiative that they have going, um, you know, the Belt and Road initiative they have where it's, you know, going after that because a lot of people don't realize Venezuela actually has the world's largest oil reserve, not the Middle East. It also has, unlike Middle East oil, it is actually the best oil. Um, there's also some rare earth minerals that are buried in some of uh, their, their rainforest and jungle area that has not been properly exploited or even gone after. So Venezuela is an enormously rich country. It's yeah. just run by an idiot right now who is, you know, just trying to keep themselves afloat with socialism. So yeah. 
If yeah, they, they were they, ever to properly exploit that country, they'd be one of the wealthiest countries in the world. They were prior, what, 15? They were, years yeah, ago, prior, they to, were the prior to Chavez company. coming power in 2000, yeah. Yeah, yeah, richest country per capita out there. Yeah, you know, it just shows you good leadership, bad leadership. Um, some of the some of the stuff I, I saw with, I think it's Maduro, um, I think it was maybe six, seven months ago, the cities were burning and this guy had people deliver a freaking steak dinner to him while people were standing in line for, for bread right. half a day. All right. And I thought to myself, someone needs to pop that clamp. <laughs> Fictionally, of course, but. <laughs> yeah, but it's just terrible, you know, it's terrible. It's... Well, he's got a bounty on his head now. Trump put a bounty on his head. <laughs> well, you run out of everyone else's money, and, you know, everything kind of collapses. You know, you've got to create an economic, an economy and a society that generates wealth for everyone. Because yeah. If it doesn't generate wealth or create an opportunity, you're kind of screwed. You know, when yeah, you look you at Amazon. You look at Amazon, what they did. You and I weren't writers. You know, I worked, I used to work in the government and I worked in cybersecurity insurance and stuff. You know, and, and you worked, you know, totally different I'm career. In sales. Field. Yeah, you were in sales. And then what do we do? We both read a lot of books. We said, well, heck, I could do this. Hold mm -hmm. my beer. And we came up with a book. And then yeah. all of a sudden it started selling a few copies. We went, wow, I actually sold a few copies. Let me try a second book. And before you know it, we're six, seven books deep into it. We're like, dang. I'm making more doing this than I am in my normal day job. I'm going to quit and do this because I have more yeah. fun with it. But the, that's that's an economic opportunity that wasn't available 15 years ago. No, it wasn't. We had no way to, we would have had no way to go. I was writing back then trying to get published. And if you don't know somebody in New York and you're not buddies with someone who's already published, good luck, man. You're never going to get in there. You got a 99.9% you .9 .9 chance of not getting anywhere doing it that way. So when Amazon brought this forth, then the game changed. It it, it said, okay, you think you can do it? Stand on your own. Find okay, somebody fine. to do your, your book covers, get your books edited, go in and format them and do it all yourself and see how well you can do. And guess what we have? And that's great. And I'm yeah. grateful for that opportunity. And a lot of people that whose dreams died, you know, with those multiple rejection letters, their dreams don't have to die anymore. You know, th there's things I like and don't like about Amazon, but I love the fact that they allow me to make a career of doing something that I love because I had a great job before, but I hated it. Yeah. And I hated it because, you know, they, they took pieces of my soul every single day and I was busy working for someone else's dream, not my own. Yep. And, you know, now I get to, I get to write books and make up stories and I have people that, that read it, love it, and we interact and my readers are fantastic. I love every one of them. Um, and we get a chance to interact with them. That's another thing traditional authors don't get. They don't get the chance to interact with their readers. I mean, you're, you take your group, your beta group of 90 people. I have 20, 25 people in mind that I'm with regularly. And these people help shape the novels, but they also get to be a part of something, you know, bigger than, than what they're at right, right now. And I, I've heard, you know, our, our readers say that they're grateful for that. And I'm grateful for that yeah. because it allows us to have better books. So you get this big interaction that to me feels better. And, you know, most of us make more than most traditionally published authors anyway, and we have our freedom. Yeah, yeah. We're not getting hosed by the, <laughs> the publishers. So anyway, good times, man. Yeah. Well, we've been chatting for a while, so we probably should uh, end it yeah. somewhere here, but we can do uh, another one down the road because God knows we need to have some good content that isn't so negative and focus on all the stuff going on in today's today. Oh, I'm into that. So we can hopefully that. give our readers something new to think about. So if you're one of my readers, I encourage you to check out Ryan's books. You'll love them. Um, you'll, you'll appreciate the level of intricate detail he puts into them all in the character development. Yeah, and you'll like James because James gives you a piece of something real. You get, yeah. uh, you get aspects of someone who walked those, uh, walk those paths. And I've introduced my, my uh, readers to your books, and they, they tend to like them quite a yeah, bit. It's funny. One of the comments, I got a comment from a couple of readers that said, man, those interrogation scenes, they seem pretty real. How did you come up with that kind of material? I was like, I you realize I was an interrogator before I did all this, right? Like, that was yeah. my actual job was to do this. So, yeah, well, I like I said. a wish list of what we should have been allowed to do. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, it made it awfully real and a lot of fun. So, all right, man. Well, we will chat again, and I'll talk with you later. Thanks for taking the time. All right. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye.